Well, we came up in a time where black art was not the norm, and it was kind of negated and neglected, and frankly, people didn't even want to deal with it. I'm Thinga McCannon, an artist who's been working for the last 54 years. I met these guys, and I was just beginning to become aware of Afrocentricity. I was in love with Nina Simone, and um, when I met them, they were very pro-Africa, very Afrocentric, and they kind of, um, what would you say, they adopted me, because I was 17. And not only did they show me uh, the technical side of art, like where you get your paints and how to make prints and all of that, but they gave me a really good direction mentally and I just kept going from there. I started with painting, printmaking, the traditional art forms. I ended up, in order to support my early art habit, I began to make dashikis, which was a plain, simple African garment. From there, I went into wearable art. From there, I went into printmaking. From there, I went into writing and illustrating children's work. Then I did murals. And you know, it just went on and on and on. And one thing sort of just fed into the other. Currently, I'm a uh, I guess I consider myself a fiber artist because within the realm of fiber, there's no holes barred, there's no lines that you have to stay into, and you can use anything that your imagination can turn into something else. The revolutionary system, I don't quite remember how I came up with that concept of using nails and screws and all of that, but I know I like to play with stuff that was different. The top of the piece, that has, it has a little thing there. I had did that because I don't drive, I never drove, and I had to be able to transport my artwork. And somehow I figured out how to put a hinge on there so that that head folds down so that she's remained intact 50 years later. When I first joined with Wayusi, it was a mixed group, but over that summer, somehow the women kind of dropped out, and the next thing I know, it was just me. So one day I called up uh, it was either Faith or Kay, I don't remember who came first. And I said, you know, do you know any other black women artists? And as the conversation went on, we decided to call up everybody that we knew and have them meet at my house. And that's how where we had started. Uh, as I look back on our records, we were extremely well organized. We went and got grants and put women to work. And the type of work that we did was community-based. We worked in prisons, we worked in shelters, we worked in schools, we worked in parks. Because of the fact that we survived and we had a dream back then that everybody told us you know, it's not gonna happen, you can't do that, there's no black women artists, women don't supposed to be artists, and so forth and so forth. So most of the women, even those who are not here, these are my heroes or my sheroes. Because, because we all came together, we had a common goal, a common idea, and a common love of art. This uh, is my famous Where We At coat, <laughs> because um, Where We At existed for like at least 25 years. Uh, the only sad thing about the war exhibition is that out of the 40 members, I think maybe 10 to 15 of us are left. Where we at was a sisterhood. We were really, it was, we were a sisterhood. And in the spirit of that sisterhood, I felt that I couldn't come and just represent myself. I wanted to represent everybody. And so I tried to figure out how I would do that. And I made this coat. I embroidered everybody's name that I could find who was in the group. I have pictures and images and all that. And to every time war opens, I wear this. So it's like I'm bringing everybody with me.